So at the, la at the uh, end of our last lesson, uh, we left Joseph in Potiphar's jail, wrongly accused of having attempted to rape the chief, the chief official's wife. Not a good thing. Uh, and we know that uh, jo uh, Joseph rises to an important position in the jail, and while there he uh, uses his special gifts of uh, dream interpretation to explain the dreams of two high officials who are in jail pending an investigation into some plot against the Pharaoh. His interpretations are realized. One of the officials is restored back to his position. The other one is executed exactly as he had uh, uh, said. And then the final scene sees him asking the freed official to help him get out of jail when he returns to the palace. But, of course, he forgets and Joseph remains in prison for another two years. All right, so in today's lesson we're going to look at the events that take Joseph out of prison and propel him to a leadership position over the entire nation. So let's go to chapter 41 and let's begin reading in verse one. It says, now it happened at the end of two full years that Pharaoh had a dream and behold he was standing by the Nile and lo from the Nile there came up seven cows sleek and fat and they grazed in the marsh grass. Then behold seven other cows came up after them from the Nile ugly and gaunt and they stood by the other cows on the bank of the Nile. The ugly and gaunt cows ate up the seven sleek and fat cows. Then Pharaoh awoke. He fell asleep and dreamed a second time, and behold, seven ears of grain came up on a single stalk, plump and good. Then behold, seven ears, thin and scorched by the east wind, sprouted up after them. The thin ears swallowed up the seven plump and full ears. Then Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. So Joseph's dreams, you know, they seem to come in pairs. Uh, you know, he had his two dreams you know, where his family were bowing down before him. Then in jail, two more dreams you know, that the, uh, the, uh, the officials had, and now the two dreams of the, um, of the Pharaoh. Interesting thing, uh, cows were especially significant in Egypt because the cow was the emblem of Isis, the goddess of fertility. In the, uh, in the Book of the Dead, the main holy book of ancient Egypt, the god of vegetation, uh, or Isis, is represented by a bull accompanied by seven cows. So it wasn't just any animal that he saw in his dream, he saw something which was very significant to him as far as the religion of the Egyptians. So cows were a significant religious symbol and a dream that had such startling imagery involving cows would have seemed significant to the Pharaoh. Also the dream about the crops had impact because Egypt with its fertile lands near the Nile was considered the granary to the ancient world. I mean, they were the breadbasket for you know, surrounding nations. So the dreams, although physically impossible, seemed so real that when he awoke, the Pharaoh was relieved to see that he was only dreaming. So let's keep, let's keep reading. It says, now in the morning his spirit was troubled, so he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men, and Pharaoh told him his dreams, but there was no one who could interpret them to Pharaoh. Then the chief cupbearer spoke to Pharaoh, saying, I would make mention today of my uh, own offenses. Pharaoh was furious with his servants, and he put me in, con in confinement in the house of the captain of the bodyguard, both me and the chief baker. We had a dream uh, on the same night. He and I, each of us dreamed according to the interpretation of his own dream. Now a Hebrew youth was with us there, a servant of the captain of the bodyguard, and we related them to him, and he interpreted our dreams for us. To each one he interpreted according to his own dream. And just as he interpreted for us, so it happened. He restored me to my office, but he hanged him. So in his dreams, the two symbols of Egypt's religious and economic wealth were destroyed, and of course this troubled the Pharaoh. The magicians and fortune tellers of Egypt had great powers, as uh, Moses found out later. God's servants uh, you know, demonstrate power given to them by God in order to create faith and praise to God. But you know what? Satan, you know, Satan also has power. That's the thing that we uh, need to uh, realize. He has power, although it's limited by God. 
you know, I mean, think about the things that happened to Job. You know, God said to Satan, okay, you can do that, but don't kill him. So we know that Satan exercises some power in the physical world. It's naive to say, oh, that, oh, that occult, there's nothing to that, there's no power. No, 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 the Bible doesn't say that there's no power there. It just says, this isn't power being exercised by God, being permitted by God, but not exercised by Him. So Satan's servants exercise certain powers in order to draw people away from the faith in God or to cause delusion or just cause harm. So he had the power to give, for example, he had the power to give all the kingdoms to Jesus. I mean, how many people have given their souls in exchange for success or rulership in this world? You know, a lot of people exercise occult power as did these ancient magicians. So we don't deny that strange and occult power exists. We simply say that it does not come from God and that it is not greater than God, but God only permits it. He permits it for a time, permits it, you know, like Satan, he said, well, I'll, I'll permit you to do this to Job, but you can't go further than this. So this is quite evident in this passage as the magicians and fortune tellers try to interpret the important dream of the Pharaoh. Now these people here, uh, you know, these uh, fortune tellers, these people were the the, the advisors at court who guided the king in a lot of his affairs of state. They realized, of course, the significance of the dream, but they couldn't conjure up a satisfying answer as to what it meant. So at this point, the butler remembers Joseph and his remarkable and concise interpretation of the dreams that they had in prison. And so at this point, they have nothing to lose and the butler is at no risk in making this suggestions. So it's like, yeah, why not? You know, nobody else has got a shot. Nobody else is interpreting. The butler goes, well, I, I don't risk anything if I, if I suggest uh, Joseph because uh, everybody else has failed. So let's keep reading verse uh, 14, 15, and 16. It says, then Pharaoh sent and called for Joseph, and they hurriedly brought him out of the dungeon. And when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came to <coughs> Pharaoh. Uh, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, but no one can interpret it, and I have heard it said about you that when you hear dream, you can interpret it. Joseph then answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. So you know, the one thing about the Egyptians, they were very particular about cleanliness, only allowing their beards to grow in times of mourning, for example. And Joseph uh, is summoned out of the prison and quickly cleaned up in preparation for his appearance before one of the most powerful rulers of the then known ancient world. So the Pharaoh lays before him the problem of the dream and the inability of the magicians to uh, interpret it. And this could have been a great, you, know, you ever think, what an opportunity for Joseph. I mean, you know, payback time. <laughs> I mean, uh, he, he could have you know, been proud and flattered by the attention that he was getting. Uh, he could have tried to bargain his way out of jail. You know, I'll interpret the dream if you give me you know, a convoy, safe convoy back to my family, so on and so forth. Uh, he could have exchanged his power for financial gain. Could have done those things. Uh, you don't forget, he's been in jail for a long time. But his 13 years in captivity have taught him patience, Restraint, humility. You know, have, we, have, we ever, have we not said to our children from time to time, you don't have to say everything that goes through your mind. <laughs> you might have a lot of things streaming through there, you know, but you don't have to say all of them. You know? We call that restraint. <laughs> it's okay to hold back. Uh, I'm not talking about you, Bobby, but you know. <laughs> So what happens? He immediately acknowledges that he has no power except God. Wow, there's a more spiritually mature Joseph there that we see. And he makes no conditions for the interpretation. And he assures Pharaoh that the situation, although difficult, would end in peace because he says, you know, I'll give you a favorable answer. So that's the confidence of a spiritual man. So in, in, in the past, 
you know, Joseph had used his gift to try to do dominate and elevate himself in front of his brothers. You know, he had the dream, it was true, but he, he had to go and tell it to his brothers. Hey, I had a dream, you guys were bowing down to me. So there, there's the restraint part that, that he should have exercised, right? But now, after the painful lessons that he has learned, he manages to act in a restrained and gracious way while in control of the king's court. I mean, he's in control here. He knows, you know, he knows that he's going to be able to do this, that God is using him. So in the next verses, I'm not going to read the next ones, the king simply repeats his dream to Joseph for his interpretation. And he adds some details, like the thin cattle uh, were in work shape after eating the, the seven fat ones. And he also explains how the magicians were helpers in trying to explain the dreams. Now remember, Joseph says to the king, I will give you the interpretation and it'll be a favorable one. But he tells this to the king before the king actually tells him what the dream is. So there is you know, confidence, not in himself of course, but confidence in God. You know, we have a saying nowadays, you know, we say, man, that's a God thing. You know what I'm saying? It's a God thing, meaning you prayed about something, you hoped about something, and out of nowhere, you know, a good thing happens, the answer to your prayer, it's completely, it makes com no sense whatsoever, but it happens, you know, and you say, wow, thank you, that was a God thing. That was, you know, that was a God thing. Well, uh, Joseph has this confidence that He's in jail and two years you know, after he's been in prison for so long, who knows if he you know, has lost hope, he gets called out of jail to go help the king of the nation. And that was a God thing going on there. So he had confidence. So this acknowledgement here suggests that the, you know, that the king was, he was not only afraid of the problems that the dreams foretold, but he wasn't equipped to handle a national crisis. That's another thing. So in verse 25, we pick up the story there. It says, now Joseph said to Pharaoh, Pharaoh's dreams are one and the same. God has told to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good ears are seven years. The dreams are one and the same. The seven lean and ugly cows that came up after them are seven years, and the seven thin ears scorched by the east wind will be seven years of famine. It is as I have spoken to Pharaoh. God has shown to Pharaoh what he is about to do. Behold, seven years of great abundance are coming uh, in, uh, in, all the land of, uh, in all the land of Egypt. And after them, seven years of famine will come and all the abundance will be forgotten in the land of Egypt and the famine will ravage the land so the abundance will be unknown in the land because of that subsequent famine, for it will be very severe. Now as for the repeating of the dream to Pharaoh twice, it means that the matter is determined by God and God will quickly bring it about. So Joseph explains the significance of the numbers. Two dreams are a sure confirmation that God is sending the dream. And seven cows, seven ears represent years of good and bad. The interpretation you know, is so natural, so obvious, that it is accepted by all of the people who hear it. Now there's some interesting notes about the use of God's name here by Joseph. Joseph, um, Joseph um, distributes or attributes the dreams and interprets four times in these, uh, in these passages. So whenever he refers to God in speaking to the Egyptians, he uses the term Elohim, which means mighty creator and sovereign king, a term which the Egyptians could actually relate to. Whenever the writer refers to God and Joseph in their relationship, he uses the term Jehovah, which means Lord. And so to Joseph, you know, he's talking about God as Lord, his Lord. When he's talking about God to the Pharaoh, he's talking about the one who creates everything, the one who is over everything, all right? And, and simply the idea that 
you have to sometimes know how to speak to somebody about God based on where they're coming from, based on what their, their, their background is, okay? So in verses 33 uh, to 36, it says, now let Pharaoh look for a man discerning and wise and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh take action to appoint overseers in charge of the land and let him exact a fifth of the produce of the land in the seven years of abundance. Then let them gather all the food of these good years that are coming and store up the, gain, uh, the grain for food in the cities under Pharaoh's authority and let them guard it. Let the food become as a reserve for the land for the seven years of famine which will occur in the land of Egypt so that the land will not perish during the famine. So God not only provides the interpretation but also a plan of action through the mouth of Joseph. So he says what, basically? Find a worthy administrator, appoint the officers to collect a special tax, 20%, build storage facilities to store the 20% of food bought with taxes, or collect this tax into storage. So the plan would avoid the situation where the, um, uh, the responsibility over life and death of everybody would reside in a single person, which is the king, and would allow provisions and distribution for the future. You know, Joseph's plan, or God's plan through Joseph is, let's spread this around. Let, let's put you know, uh, 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 distribution points throughout the land. Let's not just have all the grain in, in the king's granary, you know, so that the king is responsible for every single person coming. You know, let's spread it around, okay? So uh, there's no reason to think that Joseph is thinking of himself here. He's simply continuing to give God's message following the interpretation. All right, so let's, now the story turns and we see what happens to Joseph. And again, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with this, pretty familiar story. It says, now the proposal seemed good uh, to Pharaoh and to all his servants. Notice, all the servants. There wasn't going to be a rebellion here. There wasn't going, you know, middle management wasn't going to get all upset now because a new guy was coming in. Then Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find a man like this in whom is a divine spirit? So Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has informed you of all this, there is no one so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house and according to your command, all my people shall do homage. Only in the throne um, I will be greater than you. Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took off his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand and clothed him in garments of fine linen and put the gold necklace uh, around his neck. He had him ride in his second chariot and they proclaimed before him, Bow the knee, and he set him over all the land of Egypt. Moreover, Pharaoh said to Joseph, Though I am Pharaoh, Yet without your permission, no one shall raise his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh named Joseph Zephanath Paneah, there we go, and he gave him Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, a priest of On, as his wife. And Joseph went forth over the land of Egypt. So Pharaoh and his advisors recognize that Joseph is the right person for the job because they recognize that the Spirit of God is in him. May, they may not understand you know, Jehovah God, that God, you know, but they are believers in divine spirits and you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, supernatural uh, beings and, and they recognize, okay, so there's something special or divine about this guy. So we're going to let him take care of it. And the way that he had revealed the dreams not only provided an interpretation, but also his humble and poised and wise presentation had made an effective witness for God before the pagan king and his court. So the king was consciously acting according to God's will by accepting the interpretation and selecting. He could have got proud and puffed up and said, okay, now I know, all right, you just go, you know, we'll, we'll give you a pardon you know, and you know, go get a job and <laughs> or, or, or I, I permit you to go back home. You know, we'll take it from here. Because don't forget, Joseph's a foreigner. He's a guy from jail. And yet the Pharaoh humbled himself and allowed Joseph uh, to take charge. 
So all the signs of power are now given to Joseph in order to elevate him in the eyes of the people so he could carry out this, uh, this project. Um, he needed their acceptance in order to collect taxes and food without confusion, without resistance. Remember now, they don't have newspapers and you know, phone trees and things like that. So just because the king and his advisors you know, accept Joseph's proposal doesn't mean that all the people in the land know about it. So this is the way of letting the, the nation know that Joseph has been appointed to a special task. He receives the appointment from the Pharaoh to the number two position without resistance from other uh, counselors. He receives a signet ring as a seal for official documents. He receives a new and official wardrobe. And he receives the gold chain and medal which signify his authority. And then they organize a royal procession as a way of introducing him and his new position to the people as the number two in command of the land. And interestingly enough, the king also finds him a wife. Since he was not an Egyptian, he needed this credibility through marriage to be accepted by the population. Now we don't know a lot about his wife. You know, his wife was a daughter of a pagan priest. We don't know of her you know, conversion, if you wish, only that Joseph uh, had her as wife and had only her as wife, just one wife, and that their children were raised as believers in uh, in Jehovah. So let's keep going. It says, now Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went through all the land of Egypt during the seven years of plenty and the land brought forth abundantly. So he gathered all the food of these seven years which occurred in the land of Egypt and placed the food in the cities. He placed in every city the food from its own surrounding fields. Thus Joseph stored up grain in great abundance, like the sand of the sea, until he stopped measuring it, for it was beyond measure. Now before the year of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph, whom Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, a priest of On, bore to him. Joseph named the firstborn Manasseh, for he says, God has made me forget all my trouble and all my father's household. He named the second Ephraim, for he said, God has made me fruitful in the land of my uh, addiction, uh, uh, not addiction, uh, affliction. <laughs> wrong class there, wrong class. So Joseph immediately begins to survey the land, collect the food, to allay fear of the, the fears of the people. As I said, the storehouses are built in different cities. Joseph has two sons, gives them names uh, to signify how he feels. Manasseh means forgetting, you know, forgetting the troubles that he's had, and Ephraim means doubly fruitful, so they reflect his, you know, his new status in life. So the years were bountiful to the point where it was difficult to keep track of everything that was in storage. So from prison to prince, it's the name of this lesson by the way, from prison to prince, God had restored Joseph in a single moment. And this is a, you know, a wonderful lesson for us when we are discouraged. You know, we, we need to recognize that you know, God can restore us in a moment, whether it be here on earth or in the twinkling of an eye when Jesus returns. He can, you know, maybe what I'm trying to say is God can turn things around you know, so quickly, more quickly than we can, but it's not usually the way we think He's going to do it. You know? We usually lay out a plan for him. Now, Lord, if you'll do this and that, if you can just come through on this here, you know, wow, it'll be great. And uh, most of the times it doesn't work out that way. It doesn't work out. So Joseph, you know, he maintained his faith, and when he was restored, it was as if the 13 years in prison and the suffering and the loneliness and the injustice had never happened. No bitterness in him. You know, that, that, that was really, to me, that's the miracle, working in Joseph's heart no bitterness for what had taken place. I, I believe that heaven is going to be like this. We're going to remember people and places. We know who we are. As I've said before, if we don't know who we are, then it isn't heaven. It isn't heaven if we don't know who we are. It's, it's a Hinduism, it's Buddhism, you know, like you're just absorbed into the great force. You, know, you lose your own personality. In order for it to be heaven, I have to know it's me. I have to know Wow, this was true. <laughs> so 
uh, we're going to remember people and places and events, but the greatness of our experience there will be such that it will make our experience here like it never happened. You know what I'm saying? Some people say, yeah, yeah back you know, 10 years or so there was a bad thing that happened. And I, remember, I remember that bad thing happened, but now that bad thing no longer has the power to hurt me anymore. I remember it, but it doesn't hurt me anymore. And I think that heaven will be like that. We'll, we'll, we'll understand what has happened to us, but our past and our failures and all the sin, that, that'll be removed, far gone from us, and will no longer have the power to make us feel guilty. Even though I'm forgiven, and even though I'm saved, and I know I'm saved, there are moments, like, there are moments that I feel like a failure. There are moments that I feel like I'm really, I'm not good enough. You know? and, I, and I think everybody feels like that from time to time. I'm just not good enough. You know? and, and I think that heaven will finally cut that cord there where we'll be able to remember things, but it won't affect us like it does here. So let's finish up. It says, uh, when the seven years of plenty which had been in the land of Egypt came to an end, and the seven years of famine began to come, just as Joseph had said, then there was a famine in all the lands, but in all the land of Egypt um, there was bread. So when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried out to Pharaoh for bread, and Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, go to Joseph, whatever he says to you, you shall do. When the famine was spread over the face of the earth, then Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians, and the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. The people of all the earth came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph because the famine was severe in all the earth. So just as he had predicted, the famine arrives, the seven years of great abundance end. This caused the people to look to Pharaoh for help and he pointed them to Joseph. That was the arrangement. Uh, and he put his you know, food bank, if you wish, into service. In addition to the food shortage in Egypt, it says here there was the face of the earth. So it wasn't just Egypt that was affected by the famine, but the surrounding countries. And these people came to buy food. This, of course, was part of God's plan to eventually bring the children of Israel to Egypt 400, for 400 years. All right, so let's stop the narrative there and uh, let's see if we can draw a, a couple of uh, just practical lessons from this narrative. And, and, and the last you know, 10 chapters of, uh, of Genesis is like that. It's a narrative, it's a story of Joseph. Okay? So a couple of lessons uh, that, that, that I see here. First one is, we are on God's timetable. I want to tell you, man, that's, that's one of the hardest lessons to learn. We'd be a lot less stressed out if we understood that we're on God's timetable, not our own. He brings us into the world he brings us out of the world and He will order everything in between if we let Him. You know, we get into more trouble and worry because we either get ahead of Him by not seeking His will in prayer or we get behind Him by refusing to obey His will and we go our own way. So we're either too far ahead or too far behind. Joseph learned that God was working things out in his own time and that he could use Joseph when he was ready. So Christians, you know, we have eternity and this helps us to have a patience in this world while God accomplishes His purposes using His own schedule. You know, sometimes it's not that we're not ready, you know, we're like ready, but it's the situation isn't ready yet, the, the time has not ripened yet for God to use us in a, certain, in a certain way, as was the case with Joseph. You know, he wanted to get out of jail and, you know, and so on and so on. He was serving in jail and, and he hadn't lost his faith and he was ready, but God, was, you know, the time wasn't ri ripe yet, so he spent another two years in jail until the time was ripe. And that happens to us too. You know, we're, like I say, instead of praying, uh, uh, God, when is that going to happen? Uh, when are you going to make this happen? Maybe the prayer should be, God, what, what do you want me to do while I wait for you? While I'm waiting for you to act, Lord, and I know you'll act, 
I'm not sure as to what I should be doing. Can you help me know what I should be doing as I wait for you, as I wait for this thing, whatever it is I'm waiting for, hoping for? Lesson number two, God lifts up the humble and lowers the, prou lowers the proud. In this story we see two men exercise humility. Joseph learned it through trials and suffering and we see his character changed and because of it, God raises him from captivity and places him at the right hand of the most powerful king in the world at that time. That's one person who humbled himself. And then the Pharaoh. The Pharaoh didn't learn humility from suffering. Uh, you know, he was the king. He came from being confronted with the power of God in Joseph's work and character. The king could have rejected Joseph's interpretation, rejected this advice from a jailed foreigner, but he humbled himself and God saved his country and saved his crown. You know, as far as the king is concerned, he wants to save his crown and his dynasty. If he fails the people, the people will turn on him. You know, somebody in court is going to say, you know what, I can do better than this guy. And I mean, that's how they, they didn't have elections in those days, you know. <laughs> so we know that God hates pride and the Bible says that He actively, He actively works against the proud and conversely, He works for the humble. So it should make us think twice about you know, puffing up and being difficult when offended or contradicted. The meek are the ones who are going to inherit the earth. The proud will inherit a rebuke. And, and punishment, and that's pretty much a, you know, a, a standard lesson that begins very early in the Bible and goes all the way to the, uh, to the end. And then perhaps one more, prosperity always comes from God according to His purpose. You know, these pagans were unaware that their prosperity came from the God of Joseph. They worshiped all kinds of fertility and nature gods and appealed to them for good harvests and so on and so forth. So worshiping a pagan earth god or the god of money or the god of leisure or the god of self-reliance or the god of good government or humanism or the god of central planet, it's all the same thing. God our Father, the Lord, Jesus Christ, He's the one who prospers nations and, 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 and blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. He's the one. You know, our, our great uh, joy, our great gift is we get to thank the right God. <laughs> That's the wonderful thing. You know, uh, Ron and I were talking today just about prayer. You know, we were sharing some ideas about prayer. And one of the things that we kind of were talking about is the role of prayer like one of the things that it does for us. And one of the things that prayer does for us is that it provides closure in the sense that when something wonderful or good or prosperity happens to us as Christians, we respond to that with thanksgiving. So today, a wonderful day, you know, good things happen today, so on and so forth. At the end of the day, unlike an unbeliever, I'm able to say, Lord, Thank you so much for the wonderful meals that I've had, the fellowship with a friend, the, the beautiful day, the good health I enjoy. You know, thank you for all those things, Lord. I have, I have closure in contemplating the good things in my life through prayer. An unbeliever will experience the same things that I have experienced but will say, Man, I hope this continues, and what if, what if, I, what if I don't have my health uh, tomorrow? What if I lose my health? You know, and I, man, I, I, want, I wonder if my, my savings will hold out, or you know, I wonder if the job will keep going. You know what I'm saying? They, they, a good thing happens, they have no way to, 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 to feel closure about that thing. And so that's one, that's one thing, not the only, but that's one thing that prayer does for us. It enables us to have closure when we think about or contemplate our blessings. You know, one of, the, uh, one of the great roles and concerns as the church is that 
it is we, the believers, who many times stand between God and, and the nation for God's continued blessings. You know, without Joseph, they would have been ruined. Without Joseph, one man. And I believe without God's people everywhere, God's wrath would fall upon the nations. So we're not kidding when we pray for our nation, when we pray for our leaders, when we pray for these people, when we pray that God please you know, have mercy on us, for, forgive us as a nation for some of the foolish and ungodly things that, that go on here. You know? We're standing in the gap for our nation. So yeah, we only get one vote each. That's the way it works in a democracy, right? But we also contribute prayer on behalf of our nation. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm of the opinion that there are many people who are praying. There are thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people who are praying to God, asking Him the same things that we're asking Him. And I firmly believe that God continues to bless us as a nation because His people maintain a daily you know, uh, offering of prayer uh, before God. Very, very, very important. We don't, we don't pray for our military, we don't pray for our leaders, we don't pray for these things in vain. That's not a waste of time and it's not an addendum. You know, yeah, I might as well pray, can't hurt. Uh -uh. I believe the proactive power of prayer is what keeps us safe and keeps us going in this nation. So we need to be especially prayerful that this country, which has enjoyed tremendous prosperity in the last two centuries because of its faith, does not inherit God's wrath because of its unfaithfulness at the present time. We do well to pray and serve the Lord and hope He spares our country because of the righteous ones that live within this country. Now at what point He wants to exercise His discipline, we don't know. But in the meantime, I encourage everybody, keep praying, keep, keep asking God to protect us and, and bless us. It, it, it isn't our ballistic missiles or military, I think, in the end that will save us. It's uh, our, our faith that God will help us use whatever power we have in such a way that will enable us to be safe and to consider to be uh, prosperous. All right, so some lessons from Joseph's uh, from Joseph's captivity and rise from, what is it, from prison to prince. All right, so this is the last story that we're covering, of course, it goes right to the very end. Continue next week uh, as Joseph's story uh, continues and as he comes face to face with his family and the brothers that sold him into slavery. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>